What were the pastors like in the early church? Hi, welcome to today's little lesson. Thank you so very much for joining me once again as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse journey through the entire book of Acts. And we're about halfway now in Acts chapter 14, following along with Paul and Barnabas during the first missionary journey. And you perhaps, probably, if you've got a hard copy of the Bible, you'll have some maps in the back. And one of those maps would show you the first and then the second and then the third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. The first missionary journey was shorter than the second one as you look at the course of Paul's path. And um, it took him, both, both of those missionary journeys took him into some of the same regions, although in the second mission journey, of course, he went further. But both, both occasions, Paul went to the region in modern-day Turkey called Galatia. And of course, he later wrote uh, an, a letter to the church in Galatia because it was in trouble. And we talk about that when we come to Acts chapter 15 because it's so relevant and pertinent to that discussion. But in any case, um, Paul had, you know, saw some wonderful miracles in the Galatian city of Lystra. There was a man who had never walked lame from his mother's womb. And as Paul's up there preaching the gospel, he somehow discerns that the man has faith to be healed. And he tells him to stand upright on his feet. And the man leaps up and begins to walk. And the crowd misinterprets what's just happened. They haven't been listening too closely. And they say, hey, the gods have become like men and have become among us and the Greek gods. So they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes and wanted to offer sacrifices to them. And with difficulty, we read in our last lesson that they were able to restrain them from doing that, you know, trying to get them to turn from their idolatry and their beliefs in these uh, gods that were just uh, figments of their imaginations. Anyways, uh, things were going great in Lystra until some Jews arrive from Iconium and Antioch, where they had already preached the gospel and and had some success, but also suffered persecution at the hands of the Jews. So Jews travel all the way from Antioch and Iconium, and we read this in our last lesson in verse number 19. Having won over the crowds there in Lystra, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. So he was either dead and was resurrected, or he uh, you know, was unconscious and he came back to consciousness. But no doubt, he, you know, he looked like he had just been stoned. And so he would have had bruises and welts and, and, you know, and probably blood, different parts of his body, and he would have been hurting. But uh, Paul was an intrepid soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, he, he didn't run. He went back into the city from whence they had stoned him, which is incredible. But the next day they left, and they went. Uh, he went away with Barnabas to Derby, another Galatian city. Now, this is where we left off last time. Um, after they, that would be Paul and Barnabas and whoever else was with them who we were preachers, preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. I don't know how many, many is, but, you know, it's more than just a few, okay? And notice they made disciples. Uh, there, there was not this false dichotomy that we have in many modern heretical evangelical churches. And I say that um, guardedly, but with full conviction. If you're teaching that there's two categories of Christians, the believers and the disciples, that is heresy. Because you're leading people to believe a false belief ab about salvation. That somehow you, you can be a believer in Jesus, but not be a disciple uh, and a follower of him. who A committed, devoted follower of him who's willing to lay down their life for him. Because you, know, you can read it for yourself in Luke chapter 14, the three requirements that Jesus laid down in order to be his disciple, and they all amount to one thing, you know, commitment, devotion, love for Jesus that supersedes love for anyone or anything else, including your own life. Read it for yourself 
in Luke chapter 14. If you're not a disciple of Christ, if you're not willing to die for Jesus, you're not a Christian yet. You haven't believed in him yet. You're just a American Christian, but you're not a heaven-bound Christian. And, uh, you know, when you stand before Jesus, you're going to be rudely awakened to that fact. That's why I'm telling you now, in all love and concern and compassion, not trying to win an argument, not trying to make you feel bad, but trying to help you to see that the gospel of, you know, essentially American Christianity is a false heretical gospel. It's basically the good news is, hey, you don't have to obey Jesus, you know, because it's all by grace. And, and again, that's a false grace. It's not a biblical grace. You know, the grace they're preaching is this unconditional grace, which is foreign to the Bible. And it's actually, it's foreign to human experience. Okay. Uh, so we've talked about this so many times. And I keep talking about it because it's so important that people are, you know, think they're in the boat, but they're not in the boat at all. And so Paul always made disciples, called people to live for Jesus and to obey his commandments, because that's the, that's the essence of saving faith. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord, he becomes your Lord. Okay. And people call me a heretic for saying that and a wolf in sheep clothing, but I'm never going to back down. Okay. So you might as well just give up. So they made many disciples, and then after they'd done that, they returned to Lystra. That's where Paul had been stoned, so it'll be the second time he goes back after the stone, and to Iconium, and to Antioch. That's where the Jews came to incite the crowds in Lystra that stoned him. You know, so a fearless man of God here. And he goes back to those cities, and, and what does he do? He's strengthening the souls, oh, of the disciples. Again, modern, heretical, evangelical uh, preachers and teachers would have to say, oh, he just gathered together the committed ones, not, not just the believing Christians, but the disciple Christians. <laughs> you know, what nonsense. He gathered together the, the disciples. He strengthened their souls, encouraging them uh, to continue in the faith. And so the Apostle Paul and Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, believed that people who believed in Jesus might not continue in the faith. And even though uh, heretical teachers like uh, the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Charles Stanley, said that, you know, uh, salvation is like a tattoo. Even if you wish you hadn't got it, once you got it, you can't lose it. Even if, you know, you only believe in Jesus for 10 seconds and you, by all intents and purposes, you become an atheist, you know, you're eternally secure. That's heresy. And it's so obvious, you know, from the New Testament. It's amazing to me that anyone preaches that nonsense. Uh, I don't know how they can live for themselves, okay? And when you stand for Jesus, you know, you, 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 you'll, you'll realize that you'll have to fess up to that, okay? Because we just read that Paul encouraged these disciples. These were the committed, willing to die for Jesus disciples, but persecuted disciples, and then they watch Paul, you know, be stoned. And so he encourages them, he, he's, he's strengthening their souls, and encourage them to continue in the faith. The implication is that you may not continue in the faith that you have. And again, I know these heretics say that if, if, if it appears that you backslid, you never had it in the first place. Well, again, that's a nice idea, but it's not biblical. And, and you have to understand that people who believe in once saved, always saved, well, then they have to also believe in not saved, never saved, right? Because if you're currently not saved, you could have never been saved before, because if you were saved before, you, you can't ever lose that, right? So if you believe in once saved, always saved, you also believe in, you know, not saved, never saved. And, and therefore, you, you know, you could actually never have assurance of salvation if you believe that. Why? Because these people say that if it appears that you were saved and you had some fruit and so forth, but then later you fall away, you really didn't have it. And so the fruit that you had was false fruit, which means that the fruit that you have could be false fruit. And you could also fall away and be proven, quote unquote, that you never were saved in the first place. And so nobody who believes in once saved, always saved can have assurance of salvation until the, after they die. Because right up until the moment you die, you, you're, you could backslide, which would prove you never had faith in the first place by their definition. Okay. So everyone who, you know, believes in once saved, always saved, all they can do is hope that they won't fall away, which would prove that they actually don't have faith and they were never saved. You got it. Okay. This is irrefutable. Okay. So anyways, uh, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, 
having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They commended them to who? To the Lord. And back in their day, Lord was not just a uh, casual title that we just flippantly, uh, you, you know, mentioned about, you know, oh, Lord, and the, the Lord this and the Lord this. No, Lord had the connotation of supreme king, you know, potentate, uh, you know, this is the one who made the rules and whom you obeyed, a Lord. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's one who has supreme authority. And so they believed in the Lord. And so he was their Lord. Okay. Uh, so that's what Lord means. He, he means he, he, he's the king. He's the boss. He's the master. Okay. And so what did they do uh, before they left? They appointed elders for them in every church. And this is where I want to hone in on the rest of our little lesson uh, this time, and maybe next time, because I uh, there's some scriptures I want to go to, because this is, we're going to take a deep dive, okay? And for those who are interested, um, it's going to be very, very helpful. Um, uh, and just, if you don't believe me, just stick around, okay? <laughs> um, so he appointed elders. Obviously, these would be the leaders of the church. Elders has a connotation. They were older uh, physically, you know, chronologically older because older people are supposed to have more wisdom um, within uh, churches that had some Jews with, within them. These would be people who would be knowledgeable of scripture uh, in churches that were purely Gentile and had no Jew, Jews, Jewish background believers in them. Well, they would have really virtually no biblical background, um, you know, in, in as the Jews would, but hopefully a little bit more wisdom. And so they appointed elders in order to uh, oversee the, the churches. And of course, nobody had went to church, you know, to a church building, no such thing for centuries in, in the early church. And so they were meeting primarily in houses or wherever they could. So, you know, churches were only as big as what could fit into a house. And so there were many churches in these various Galatian cities that met in different houses. And so they naturally had an elder or elders that would be in charge of, you know, taking care of those individual churches. And so the question I posed at the beginning of today's lesson is, what were the pastors like in the early church? Well, we don't read the word pastor here, did they? They didn't, they didn't appoint pastors. They appointed elders. Um, but I want to prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt that they were appointing the equivalent of pastors and that the word pastor and that the word elder are really synonymous terms so far as the New Testament is concerned. Okay. All right. The word pastor is actually only found as a title for an, an, a ministerial office one time. In the New Testament, um, you could say more than once if you count Jesus. What I'm talking about in the epistles in the book of Acts, Lord, Jesus said, I, you know, am the good shepherd. I am the great shepherd. So Jesus is obviously a, uh, that's what pastor means, by the way. Um, the one time that is found in the epistles in Ephesians 4.11, where God has appointed the church, um, uh, some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. The Greek word there for pastors is poimen. And literally, it just means shepherd. And oftentimes, it is translated as shepherd in other places. Like, for example, when she said, I'm the good shepherd or I'm, I'm the great shepherd, um, it's, it's poimain. But in the epistles, in the book of Acts, only one time do we find that uh, mentioned as a ministerial office in the church. And it's in Ephesians 4 and verse 11. Let me read that to you again, just in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, this is talking about when Jesus ascended on high. Paul writes, he, Jesus, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors, boy, main, and teachers. And so this is commonly referred to as the fivefold ministry. Um, some think it's fourfold that all pastors are also teachers, but that's actually not true. Um, you know, a, a pastors ought to be teachers or preachers, but not all teachers are pastors. Okay, not all pastors are teachers. Uh, so there are five ministerial uh, offices 
And obviously the, the, the office of a pastor is one we know experientially uh, looking at the body of Christ is one that is the most prevalent, whereas apostles would be probably the most scarce as, as our prophets. And evangelists, it seemed like there we would think there's a little more of them. But pastors are the most common, and they're the most necessary in the sense that you know every church needs to be shepherded. Uh, the, every flock, every little local flock, needs to be shepherded, and so they need a pastor. Now, why did Paul and Barnabas appoint elders in Galatia? Why didn't they appoint? pastors and why did Paul not mention elders in Ephesians 4:11 as being one of the fivefold ministry well it's because the word pastor and the word elder in the new testament are synonymous terms and i'm going to prove that to you in with with a number of verses here okay the one other office that we find mentioned in the new testament that's in the local church is the office of overseer or as the King James often translates the same Greek word that's translated, for example, in the New American Standard uh, version as overseer, the King James would translate it as bishop. And so you, you know, probably have heard about that. And we have folks who are uh, bishops today in various Christian circles, or at least professing Christian circles. And oftentimes they're regarded as higher up than elders or pastors, you know, they oversee um, a number of churches. That's the modern day perception of what a bishop is, but I'm going to show you that that's entirely unscriptural. Okay, and it's irrefutable uh, from the Bible. And if you can stick, you want if, if you want to stick with the Bible, then great. That's what I'm going to do. If you want to stick with your uh, man-made perceptions and traditions, that's your business, you know. But I'm here to. You know, stick with the Bible. That's that's my job, okay? And it's actually, you know, what you ought to be doing too. Um, so, uh, a number of verses we could look at, um, but very quickly, just a quick Greek lesson, and I, I, I won't, I promise you, I won't bore you on this, but the three words, pastor or shepherd slash leopard, you know, is poimain. Elder, presbyteros. Greek word, okay, and that's where we get our modern day word Presbyterian, okay, uh, and the presbytery is the gathering of the elders, and then bishop, King James, or overseer, same, you know, word in the Greek, episkopos, that's where we get our modern day word episcopal, episcopal church, okay, and, and, and so those are the three offices that we find mentioned in the New Testament, and they're all synonymous. Let me prove that to you very quickly in Acts chapter 20, which we will read again in our journey through, through the book of Acts. But as uh, Paul is on another journey, he comes back to Ephesus, where he has preached the gospel and established the church during his second missionary journey. And he calls to him, I'm reading from Acts 20 and verse 17, the elders of the church. In the Greek, it's the word presbyteros, elders of the church. That's what um, Paul and Barnabas did in Galatia. They appointed elders in every church, presbyteros. So in Acts 20, Paul calls together the elders, the presbyteros of the church. And, and, and when he had come to them, he said to them, that's verse 18. Now I'm going to skip over 10 verses of what he said to the elders, but because I, I, I'm, I want to make one point. Here's something he says to the elders, the presbyteros. Verse 28, be on guard for yourselves for the whole flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And that's the Greek word episkopos, or King James translates it bishops in some places. To shepherd poimen. Oh, it's the verb form, not the noun. Poimeno, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And so Paul says to the elders that you are overseers, he says to the presbyteros, you are episkopos, and I want you to poimeno, shepherd, pastor, the church of God. See, so all three of those Greek words that we find, you know, listed in various New Testament passages describing offices of authority in the church and oversight, it's all, they're all synonymous there, okay? 
Um, another place that we find um, an example of two of these words used synonymously is Paul's letter to Titus. Titus 1.5, he writes to Titus, For this reason I left you in Crete, that's an island in the Mediterranean, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders, presbyteros, in every city as I directed you. And then he gives some qualifications. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer, he's, he, he's, he says, I've left you in Crete to, to set an order what remains and appoint elders, but then synonymously he used the word episkopos, overseers, or King James sometimes bishop. See, so there you find the word presbyteros, elder, and the word overseer, episkopos, used synonymously. Peter, same deal. First uh, Peter chapter 5, verse number 1. Therefore I exhort the elders, presbyteros, among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory um, uh, to be revealed, shepherd, that's the word poimen, but it's a verb form, poimeno, the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. Okay, so in, in Titus, Paul used the word presbyteros and episkopos synonymously. In 1 Peter 5, Peter uses the word presbyteros and poimen synonymously. And in Acts 20, he uses all three of those words synonymously. Okay, so you can see that when, when, when we say there's a difference between a pastor and an elder, you know, and, and of course, many churches have, you know, concocted formulas for, you know, they have a pastor and then they have a board of elders, you know, and that kind of stuff. And then the bishops, you know, he works for the, for the denomination, you know, and he's over a whole region. In Pentecostal churches, you know, you, you often have pastors and then you have bishops who, you know, were pastors at one time and now they're bishops and they oversee, you know, the number of churches and, and it, it's all unbiblical, really nonsense and amounts to many cases, um, you know, human tradition or people just exalting themselves, giving themselves titles, which Jesus said something to say about that, didn't he? About, you know, claiming titles for yourself so that, you know, people will respect you. No, I don't understand that. You know, if you have a calling, you don't have to tell anybody. They'll recognize it because they'll see the fruit and they'll say, oh yeah, you, you, you're, you're an apostle or you're a prophet or you're, you're, you're a pastor, you know, or you're a teacher or you're an evangelist because you have the gift. You don't have to tell anybody. They'll know it. They don't give yourself the title. You know, when I was a pastor, you know, I used to tell people, I don't want to hear, don't be calling me Pastor David, you know, I don't like hearing that. Uh, if, you, if you've got to give me a title, call me Slave Dave. That'll help me remember what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be servant, serving the flock. And so I don't want a title. But many, many pastors insist that you give them, always have that title in front of their name. Why? 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 Why is that? Well, you know, everybody has to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling, you know, so, so, uh, so th those are the primary examples to prove this. So we, we, we go back when we see that they're appointing elders for them in every church in the Galatian region after they prayed with fasting. Um, they're, 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 we could just as easily said, they appointed pastors, shepherds, or they appointed overseers, or even bishops, if you want to use it. I never like to use the word bishop because it has a connotation in the English language, you know, that you don't find in uh, the New Testament. All right. So um, now, what did the what did the elders slash pastors slash overseers look like? What were the qualifications that were required of them? Well, it's a little different, you know, in in the New Testament days, and we don't have a long time to study this, but uh, if you look at the qualifications that Paul lists, was he gives instructions to Timothy in 1 Timothy, as well as to Titus in, in, in the, his little epistle to Titus, uh, primarily the qualifications were um, they have to have good character, Christ-like character. They had to be able to teach, but never did Paul say, make sure they have, you know, an awesome anointing to gather a crowd and wow people with their um, uh, entertaining sermons. No, you don't find that. And, 
and uh, it's mostly character issues. Um, let me just read from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1 and see what percentage of these qualifications are character issues and what percentage of them are, you know, gifting issues, special gifting from the Holy Spirit. It is a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office of overseer. Well, again, that's the word episkopos, synonymous with presbyteros and poimen. It is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer, Episcopos, then, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable. Oh, and there it is, able to teach. So that's not really a character issue. Not addicted to wine or pugnacious. Pugnacious means he's, you know, quick to argue and quarrel and fight. Um, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, you know, uh, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So you can see that 90% of the qualifications that Paul lists for a, a, a pastor, elder, overseer in the early church, that there were requirements, qualifications of character, Christ-like character, fruit of the Spirit rather than gifts of the Spirit. And, but yet, what, what, you know, when, when you have a pastoral search committee, and a church is looking for a new pastor. What's the what's the main thing? Well, first of all, he what's the, well, he's got to be a good speaker because that's part of the draw. And so we get people to come because you know he's got to hold their attention. And what other things? Well, you know, his wife has to play the piano <laughs> sometimes. And do we care if his kids are rebellious or not? No, no, that's we all have rebellious kids, so you know we we can't hold them to that. You know, and it's completely reversed. And why were the characters just so important? Because the primary way that pastors teach is by their example. But in most churches, again, you only see your pastor on Sunday. You see him up there on the stage. It's a, essentially a performance. Maybe an hour you hear him, you know, go through the rituals of the of the church service, give a sermon. Maybe if the church is small enough, he stands in the back and shakes their hands on the way out. That's about the only interaction you have. You have no idea how he's living his personal life. You know, have no idea about his marriage, you know, how he lives his life and so forth, about his private, you know, devotional life, his commitment to Jesus and so forth. He just, you know, he's a guy you go see for an hour. And of course, that again reveals that, you know, many pastors today, it's, it's nothing resembling a New Testament pastor because the pastors were of over small flocks, met in houses, and, and you know, it wasn't just a one-hour church service. You read in 1 Corinthians about the interactive uh, nature of the early church and the multi-giftings of the Holy Spirit, how God's using every member of the body and so forth. The pastor was a preacher, a teacher. Of course, we can see that in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul wrote, the elders who rule well should be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So there's that role. That's something that they did, um, but they had to work hard at it. That sounds like more than just one sermon a, month, a week, doesn't it? Okay, and it wasn't just a sermon to a crowd. It could be a sermon, you know, teaching individuals, tiny, small groups, you know, segments of their house, church, whatever. Unlimited possibilities to teach. Jesus didn't just teach the multitudes, did he? He was, the, he was a teacher. He called himself a teacher. He was, he was all five fold ministries in one, one person. And he was a teacher. Well, he didn't just teach the multitudes. In fact, he spent most of the time just teaching a group of hungry disciples, a small group, 12. And really, and, 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 and the way he was in a closer circle of three. See, so he was modeling what a pastor and teacher, biblical pastor and teacher does. And they could see his life. They know how he lived his life. And they could pattern their lives after him. He taught primarily by his example. And that's the New Testament pastor, elder, overseer. Okay, food for thought. And if you're a pastor, you know, you got the Bible. What are you doing? <laughs> okay, I'm not telling you this to make you feel bad. 
you know, don't get mad at me. I'm just the guy reading the Bible. Okay, and you, the same Bible you got. And, and this is essentially all irrefutable, right? It's, it's, it's not deep. Okay, out of time for today. Thank you so much for joining me on this little lesson. If you never visited our teaching website, davidservant.org, gazillions of uh, lessons there. Hope you avail yourself to it. Until next time, may the Lord keep blessing you.